Hello. All right. One more lecture. All right. So today we're going to be talking about amino acid metabolism. And uh, if I could have your attention, I know it is so painful to be in here. It's so nice outside. So, but it, is, it isn't that painful. We're learning about amino acids. Okay, so today we're going to learn about amino acid metabolism. And so today's lecture is a bit painful because when you think about it, there's really 20 metabolic pathways for degradation and 20 uh, anabolic pathways for building amino acids. So if we were actually to cover every pathway, I mean, we could spread this out over four or five lectures. Um, so instead of covering hundreds of new enzymes and, uh, um, and all these new pathways, we're going to sort of dip in a little bit to just a subset of the pathways, some of the easier pathways. Uh, and so if you want to have a comprehensive understanding, that would not be a requirement for an examination, but a lot of, even the textbook doesn't have all the pathways. Many of the steps are described as, you know, something magic happens here and then uh, and something comes out of that. Okay, so we're going to start with catabolism and then we're going to move to anabolism. We're going to look at um, so both, uh, we're going to sort of have a clinical slant today where we're going to be looking at a variety of me metabolic diseases that come up with uh, defects in uh, amino acid catabolism. But then at the end of the lecture, we're going to be looking more holistically. You know, so where, how do we get some of the feedstocks of amino acids, these ammonia? Where does ammonia come from when all, there's all this nitrogen gas in the air? So we're going to be taking an ecological slant at the end of the lecture. Okay, so let's start with catabolism. So it's a two-step process that is pretty separable. So first, you remove the amino group, um, and that reaction forms uh, alpha keto functionality on the the uh, uh, amino acid without the amino group. And then we're going to process those two parts separately. The ammonia produced from the removal of this. Uh, uh, that amino group is going to be ultimately processed, either recycled to be available for synthesis of new amino acids, or uh, if we're um, burning amino acids, if you're eating tons and tons, of, like an Atkins diet, you're eating tons of protein, well, you're going to have to get rid of uh, some of those amino groups, and that comes out of a urea cycle. And the urea cycle is intertwined with the citric acid cycle by this so-called shunt. But then we have the carbon skeleton, and literally what we can do with that is just burn it for fuel. So we can feed it into a variety of pathways, uh, either a Krebs cycle, or we can transfer um, so some remnants of those carbon skeletons to other tissues from the liver. So liver is where uh, the urea cycle is occurring. Uh, and we can uh, you know, transfer it as a, as a ketone body and regenerate the acetyl-CoA and then burn in that in the Krebs cycle. But ultimately, the idea here is um, um, burning fats, so fully oxidizing the carbon atoms in those, uh, or burning amino acids. So fully oxidizing the carbon atoms in the amino acid to CO2, ultimately. Uh, okay, so that's an overview of where we're going today. So let's look at the first part, this uh, the manipulation of the amino group. So there's lots of different sources for amino acids. Um, so if you have you know a, a diet that is high in protein, well, you're going to have a lot of amino acids coming in. Uh, but also there's a certain amount of turnover. So you have cellular proteins that are degraded to uh, amino acids, and those need to be processed. Uh, and there's different ways. So, But the, the thing of it is that um, the liver is the critical organ. So obviously you're going to have amino acid metabolism all over, but you need to transport those amino groups from whatever tissue uh, they're produced in to uh, the liver. And so there's two different molecules that are used to transport uh, uh, the amino groups to the liver. And so we have uh, ingested protein or liver cellular protein gives you amino acids and those amino groups are transaminated uh, onto uh, alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate. Okay, and producing uh, the alpha keto acid corresponding to the amino acid. So if you look at this, um, you see this is oxidized, right? And this is reduced. 
So this is not a redox process. It occurs very close to uh, equilibrium. There's no ATP hydrolysis. One molecule is oxidized, the other molecule is reduced. So we're transferring electrons between the molecule by transporting uh, this ammonia group and, and, and having the end product of these reactions be a keto group. Okay, and so um, alanine can come in here uh, and uh, from uh, muscle predominantly, and that can be uh, processed uh, to uh, pyruvate, right? So if you look at this, this is the alpha keto skeleton of uh, deaminated uh, alanine. Or you can have glutamine, right? And so you can shed uh, this amido nitrogen and the amide functionality of this amino acid you can give that up to make glutamate and then glutamate can uh, um, be deaminated um, to make uh, ammonia but what are we going to do with ammonia so ammonia is toxic we need some way to encapsulate the reactivity and the chemical properties so this is a very um, alkaline substance right so if you have a high level of ammonia your pH is going to be uh, really high so you need to do something with that to safely remove it um, from the organism. So let's look at this transamination. So this is not a net redox process, but the molecules are changing oxidation states. So you have alpha ketoglutarate um, receives an amino group, right? So this is reduced. And then this carbon is oxidized. And so you're transferring from each of the 20 possible amino acids, the amino group, onto a, a, a glutamate molecule. So glutamate forms the, the pool of amino groups, the storage pool for amino groups in the cell. And so each of these amino transferases is able to remove the amino group, forming the alpha keto form of that amino acid, and place that amino group on alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate. Okay, so there's no net gain. We're transferring amino groups, we're changing oxidation states, but there's no net change of amino groups or oxidation states. Okay, so this is a transamination. Uh, there's cofactor. So it's sort of a new type of chemistry. We need a cofactor for transamination reactions, and it, it's this pyridoxal phosphate uh, cofactor. So this cofactor is uh, originally stored on the enzyme by forming this amine, this amine or shift base with a lysine. So the epsilon amino group of a lysine forms a shift base with this uh, cofactor. But that's not a form of this cofactor that's going to be reacting with our amino acid. We have to remove um, this um, pyridoxal group from the lysine, and then it can react and form a shift base with our amino acid. And so, um, Here's, there's an aldehyde form of this, and then when it removes the amino group, ultimately you form pyridoxamine phosphate. So you have the amino group that's been removed um, from whatever uh, we're transferring amino group from uh, and put on the cofactor. Okay, and so I've added a slide uh, at this point that describes the mechanism of this reaction. The whole strategy here is to avoid the formation of uh, unfavorable carbanion. So instead of forming a carbanion, say if we just had a base pull off a proton, well, you would get a, a carbanion. But instead, we have this, you can see how this is highly conjugated, right? And so first, we form a shift base between our pyridoxal group and our amino acid. And then, when we remove this proton, we can just rearrange uh, the electrons. Uh, and so that there ends up being a double bond here, and then we can add a proton there and then get to this form of, uh, of the shift base. So now instead of having a shift base here, you have it with your amino acid. So you've changed the orientation. You're about to release this amino group. And then you just uh, reverse this such that uh, out the other end, when you add water, is the alpha keto acid, and our amino group is now placed on the cofactor. And we can do a similar reaction where we take an alpha keto acid and then place this amino group uh, in lieu of that alpha keto acid. So we're transferring an amino group from one molecule to another. Okay. Does that make sense? It's a little crazy. Just had a little mechanism today.
Okay, so what we need to do is transport um, amino acids that come uh, from proteins from all the tissues in your body to your liver. And the way this is done is you, c you can imagine, well, glutamate's not a very good transport molecule. It's highly charged. You, you know, getting that across membranes uh, is going to be uh, difficult. So if we could first convert that into a less uh, charged molecule, that would help us in our transport. So in the tissues, you have glutamate can be activated by forming a phosphoanhydride bond, in, and of course this could be hydrolyzed, that would release some energy, or um, it's a great leaving group, so uh, ammonia uh, can react with this to make uh, glutamine. That glutamine is less charged, it's great for transport of an ammonia, so we're taking ammonia from the um, tissue, taking ammonia from the tissue, and then do you see how we're releasing it uh, in the liver, so the glutamine goes into the liver where we can hydrolyze off that ammonia and then that ammonia can be processed in a type of tissue that has the enzymatic machinery to deal with the ammonia. Okay, And so this is just a simple transport. But in muscle, there's other ways, the other carriers uh, for ammonia uh, that we could use. So muscles they have a high glycolytic rate, so there's a, a large amount of pyruvate in muscles. And so pyruvate uh, is an alpha keto acid, right? So it has alpha keto group, carboxylate, and a methyl group. And so we can transfer uh, from glutamate, our storage form of ammonia, we can transfer that amino group to pyruvate to make alanine. Right, so alanine, so pyruvate is the corresponding alpha keto acid uh, for alanine. Alanine is then less charged than pyruvate, right? Uh, or it's about the same charge when you think about it, pyruvate. Yeah, but alanine is what's transported, right? Because alanine is is wither ion, right? So alanine is transport anyway. <laughs> alanine is transported. It's received in the liver, where the reverse reaction can occur. We can transfer those amino groups um, back to our storage molecule glutamate, uh, and we can convert an alpha ketoglutarate uh, to pyruvate. So transfer that. Um, um, or we can, yeah, we, we convert the alanine to pyruvate, alpha ketoglutarate to glutamate. Okay, so the net effect is to take a, ammonia from the muscle and move it into the liver. These are hanging out of the liver, but it's actually occurring within the liver. Okay. So now we have glutamate. Um, so if we're going, that's storing our ammonia, but to make urea, we have to release some of that ammonia back into solution so it can be fed into the urea cycle. And so glutamate, um, you can uh, react or convert glutamate to the alpha keto acid with release of ammonia. So this is changing the oxidation state here because here uh, this is reduced, this is oxidized, right? And so we're uh, transferring those electrons from glutamate to NADP. Uh, to form the alpha ketoglutarate. Okay, so now we have ammonia in solution. That's good because we need that to process it as waste. Okay, with me so far? Okay, so here's the overall picture. We came in either with alanine or glutamine. We made a bunch of ammonia uh, molecules. So now we need to process those ammonia molecules. Currently, we're in the liver. The uh, urea cycle occurs in two uh, organelles, in the uh, liver and in the cytosol. But we're starting in the liver with the, uh, or, or in the, uh, I'm sorry, we're in the mitochondria, and then uh, with the ammonia. And that uh, uh, urea cycle occurs in the mitochondria and the cytosol. I'll get it eventually. And so there's different ways we can deal with this ammonia. If you're a fish, you can just release the ammonia into solution because you have all this water. And as soon as you release the ammonia into solution, it's massively diluted. So we don't have to worry about the alkalinity of that molecule. If you're a vertebrate, for us, we uh, make molecules of urea. But urea is a denaturant. So if you had a really high concentration of urea, um, that would be bad. You would start to denature your proteins. So when we make urea, we put that in lots of water. We dilute it out so that it's less uh, denaturing. Um, but, you know, that wastes water. That you have to use a lot of water to, in order to uh, dilute urea. And so the other option for birds is to make a mo molecule that looks a little similar uh, to urea. It's uric acid. And you can see, well, here's a urea. 
here's the urea. And so this molecule is, is released as a slurry. Anybody that has received a gift from a bird has known about the slurry of uric acid. And that's just, it's doing the same thing we do, but with less water. So it's a little more goopy. Okay. So let's look at us. You know, we're sort of focused here on vertebrates. And so we have, uh, first, we need to begin to build our urea molecule. So we have ammonia, right? And so this ammonia uh, is, or, uh, needs to be added to a carbon atom. We, basically, we need to have two ammonias and a carbon atom, right? That's the structure of urea. So let's start with bicarbonate. There's lots of bicarbonate uh, in the cell. And the bicarbonate can be activated Right, and so this involves one high en energy phosphonhydride bond being broken. We've now activated the bicarbonate so that it can react with directly with ammonia. And so that synthesizes a uh, carbamate with release of inorganic phosphate. And you could see, man, we're so close. And you might think, well, you know, why not just do that again on the other side? Well, uh, energetically, that's not very favorable. And we need a very complicated pathway. And all we're going to end up doing is just adding another amino group on the other side of this molecule. But first, we're going to activate, right? Right, so this is our second higher energy phosphoanhydride bond broken, uh, transferring phosphate from ATP to make this carbamoyl phosphate phosphate. And this uh, reaction is catalyzed by carbamoyl phosphate synthetase, right? So in your original slides it said synthase, but this involves ATP, so we call those synthetases. That was a mistake. This occurs, as I've already mentioned, in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, and so now we have carbamoyl phosphate. Our goal is to synthesize urea. How are we going to do this? Okay, so this is, I think, the last cycle in the whole semester. That must make you very sad, but uh, it's a pretty cool cycle. So here you have carbon oil phosphate coming in, right? And so what we want to do is condense carbon oil phosphate with ornithine. Now, ornithine is an amino acid. It's not one of the 20 naturally occurring amino acids in proteins, but, you know, it has an uh, amino group. It sort of looks almost a little bit like, it's almost lysine, right? It's just a little bit shorter. And so ornithine, wherever that comes from, is combined with carbon oil phosphate to make citrulline. Do you see how uh, we've removed the phosphate and we sort of color-coded these atoms? You can see it sitting on the end of this uh, amino group of of ornithine to make citrulline. Now we're going to activate uh, citrulline, right? And so we're going to uh, make a new uh, AMP elated uh, version right here, okay? And then we're going to condense uh, that citrulline with aspartic acid uh, to make arginosuccinate. And so you would say, well, where is this aspart uh, aspartic acid just came out of nowhere? This seems like, you know, would be a bad thing to do. If you keep doing this cycle, every time you do this cycle, you'd be using up aspartic acid. We need aspartic acid to uh, make proteins. So we'll have to deal with that at some point. So here we have aspartic acid combining with citrulline to make this arginosuccinate. And if you can see here, if we were to break this bond, that would release fumarate. You say fumarate, I remember that from the TCA cycle. So that can feed into the TCA cycle, and it can make arginine. And then you have this guanidinium group in arginine, which can be uh, cleaved to regenerate our ornithine and re release our urea molecule. So all we've done, you know, in the big picture, is taken that carbon oil phosphate and put an amino group there. And we've done it in sort of a roundabout way. But there's some problems here. This is not really a cycle. It's, it's going to, if we just keep doing this, the amount of aspartate in the cell is going to go down and the amount of fumarate in the cell is going to go up. So we need a way to interconvert fumarate to aspartate. Obviously, um, that way these two can feed into each other. And the way this is done is by this so-called shunt. So fumarate um, in the cytosol, remember we moved uh, into the cytosol for uh, part of the urea cycle, especially when we generated fumarate. Fumarate can be converted to malate, and either fumarate 
or malate can be transported back into the mitochondria where it can be converted uh, to oxaloacetate, right? So we have this malate dehydrogenase. And that's sort of cool because up to this point, we've spent some energy doing this cycle, right? To make the carbamoral phosphate uh, took some energy and actually I should uh, point out here, here, we use, cleaved ATP to AMP. So we've used a total of four phosphoanhydride you know, bonds uh, to make uh, this urea molecule. Um, but in this shunt, when we're reconverting malate back to aspartate, we're generating NADH, one molecule, and that's equivalent of 2.5 ATPs. So this net process has only taken 1.5 ATPs. And the good thing is we've reconverted the output of the urea cycle into the input of the urea cycle. Fumarate has been converted back to aspartate. Aspartate has been exported out and is now ready for another revolution. So this is again, is a carbon neutral uh, pathway. The input uh, is ultimately um, the, uh, the ammonia stored on glutamate, our storage form of ammonia, is transferred to aspartate. Aspart transfers that ammonia uh, ultimately onto the urea molecule. Okay, do you see how that works? So think about urea. So the, the carbonyl group came from bicarbonate. One of the uh, amino groups came from ammonia, and the other one came from glutamate. Do you see how that comes together? Okay, and so th we've accomplished our goal. We have a safe way to deal with excess amounts of ammonia. We can just take the urea, dilute it up, and release it. So that's the urea cycle. Any questions on that? Yes. Hi. Animals that don't use urea, like uric acid. Yeah, so what is the pathways that make uric acid? You might guess. Well, I, I don't know offhand, but I would guess maybe urea, maybe at some point there would be so, some urea that's combined um, together. But I don't know the biochemical pathways that make um, uric acid. Maybe the bird um, researchers, if there are any, can tell us. And you don't know, have to know either. We're studying humans right now. Okay, so we have acetyl-CoA can be combined with glutamate to make a regulatory mo molecule. Remember that fructose 2 6 bisphosphate? It's not really a metabolite, it's sort of a signaling molecule. We have a same, similar form of regulation on the car carbamoyl phosphate synthetase, right? And so this. Um, a uh, signaling molecule in acetyl glutamate is an allosteric activator of the carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. And this sort of makes sense, right? So if we have a large amount of ammonia, we're going to have a large pool of glutamate because that's where we're storing the ammonia. Arginine also is involved in the urea cycle, but it also contains lots of nitrogens, right? So in some sense, that's also a sensor for the amount of ammonia in the cell. And so if we're building up the amount of ammonia in the cell, we need to start to deal with that issue by activating uh, the enzyme that feeds into the urea cycle. And so this is how um, this process is regulated. So overall, we've cleaved four phosphoanhydride bonds. So we've used three ATPs to make two ADPs and one AMP. That's four ATP equivalents. Uh, and we fed in aspartate, uh, and we got out uh, fumarate, right? Uh, and then, but we can, uh, um, uh, we can convert malate, we can oxidize uh, malate, and reduce NAD to NADH. And so that gives us back 2.5. Remember, the, if we did from the oxidative phosphorylation lecture, it's about 2.5 ATPs. So the net cost of this cycle is less than it would be if we didn't have this cool way to shunt um, the fumarate back into aspartic acid. And so the cell is being resourceful here. All right. So. We've only dealt with half of the problem. We've, we've looked at really a lot of the fine details there. Now we're going to come out a little bit and look at some of the ways in which these alpha keto acids are, uh, that are remaining, these carbon skeletons, are uh, metabolized. But ultimately what we want to do is use amino acids as fuel. So we're going to feed them in 
uh, to the Krebs cycle, or feed them into a formation of ketone bodies, which then can be transported to another tissue and then be fed into the Krebs cycle in that other tissue because they come out as acetyl-CoA. So these uh, different pathways, different amino acids give rise, because they have different structures, give rise to different uh, entry points into the pathway, and they can be called glucogenic or ketogenic. So glucogenic means that, well, once you feed directly into Krebs cycle, you can take oxaloacetate and push that off to make some glucose in gluconeogenesis. So that's why we call it glucogenic. Ketogenic, well, those can only, um, we cannot use those to make glucose because there are these two carbon uh, units here, right? And so um, there's no way to do that. But you can see that some of these amino acids show up in both. So as we're disassembling these carbon skeletons, skeletons oftentimes um, we can take one product when we maybe break uh, an intermediate form of the amino acid into two pieces. We can take one of those pieces, feed it into a, a, a ketone body formation. The other piece we feed in uh, directly to the Krebs cycle. So let's look at some of these uh, reactions. These are the cofactors that involve, they're involved. You've already seen pyridoxal phosphate. Biotin you've seen. Remember uh, carboxylation reactions. Uh, THF is new. Uh, and so this is important in one carbon transfers. And this, um, you can transfer between molecules either a single carbon or a single carbon that's in various oxidation sites, either being alcohol or an aldehyde. We'll see that in a moment. Atomet is only used for transfer of methyl groups between uh, different molecules. And THP, which we won't talk that much about today, is involved. It's very similar in structure to THF, um, but uh, it's more involved in oxidation reduction reactions and enzymes. So these are a whole host of different cofactors in general that are used in the catabolism of those uh, carbon skeletons of amino acids. So biotin, we've seen it like 15 zillion times. Um, carbon dioxide binds, gets transported to the second active site where it is combined with another molecule to increase the number of carbons in that molecule by one. And so um, those are important. Uh, Atomet's new to us. So Atomet, so we have uh, a methionine molecule attached to adenosine, such that you have, you might guess, a highly labeled methyl group. So here you have, you know, S plus. And so what we can do with this is we can transfer that methyl group um, to this, some other substrate molecule that we need to increase by one methyl group, um, generating this S adenosyl homocysteine. Okay, and so these are, this is a way that we're hitching a ride uh, on this cofactor, uh, making this atomet, and then depositing that methyl group on some other molecule. Okay. So here's THF. So you have uh, three parts. You have a glutamate attached to amino benzoate. Uh, and, but then the, the business end of this cofactor is a 6-methylterin, methylterin, methylterin. I think the P is silent. And so this cofactor, this part of the cofactor has these two nitrogens. And these two nitrogens can uh, be involved in making new bonds to carbon atoms. And so this, this, this cofactor is only involved with transferring single carbon atoms between molecules, either as the fully reduced form or uh, in these different oxidation states. And so if we bind with the two nitrogens, we get the equivalent of CH2OH. And if we make this uh, bond, we get um, an aldehyde equivalent. So we can transfer those um, between substrates. <laughs> OK. So we have some cofactors. Let's do some uh, catabolism. So we have a variety of amino acids that can be converted to pyruvate. And so we're just going to start scanning through some of these. Some of these are really easy. Um, yes, hi. Two slides ago. Two slides ago. Right. That means when, so here you can't really see it. Is that an aldehyde? No, it looks like something. When it is released, it becomes an aldehyde. Or when this carbon here is released, it becomes an alcohol. So for example, serine, that last methyl group on serine is by, you know, taking this CH2OH equivalent off of here and putting it onto uh, glycine. I think it's a glycine. We'll see in a moment. Yeah, it's a glycine. Okay, so that's the delivery form and the receiving form of carbon atoms for that cofactor. Okay, 
So we have um, threonine, and you'll see many of these pathways. You might guess, well, there's probably 20 different pathways, and they're all completely independent. But that wouldn't make much sense. We want to minimize the number of enzymes that we're using in these pathways. So in many steps along the way, you'll convert one amino acid to another, to another, to another, until you get to something you can burn in a Krebs cycle, ultimately, or form a ketone body. And so here you have, for example, threonine. We can disassemble uh, a threonine. Right? And so first we can, uh, we're oxidizing this carbon to a carbonyl. We can now disassemble this uh, to make an acetyl a CoA and a glycine molecule. So here's our glycine and here's our uh, acetyl a CoA. Uh, and so uh, when we make glycine, we can take two glycine molecules. One of the glycine molecules, um, we can pick off that alpha carbon in an oxidation state of CH2OH and put it on THF. The other uh, thing is we can react a second glycine molecule with that, you know, methyl from the methyl with the hydroxyl on it from the THF to make serine. So we've inter uh, converted threonine to glycine to serine. But we need to feed into uh, some pathway that generates energy here. And see, so also, um, here's a, you know, a similar set of reactions. Did I miss this slide? I think eventually we deal with the serine later. So tryptophan, can, you can disassemble this aromatic ring. We're not going to look at that. It's really complicated. But you can sort of see that, oh, OK, that has this alanine equivalent in it. So you can break this bond deal with this part of the tryptophan separately, and then you have alanine. Alanine uh, can be converted directly to pyruvate. Do you see that? So the transamination, remember, transamination with the pyridoxal phosphate re produces an alpha keto acid. So you have alanine, and you've removed the amino group and put a keto group. And so that's a direct uh, reaction. Serine, uh, you can uh, dehydrate. Uh, to uh, form a pyruvate, and cysteine can be converted into pyruvate as well. And we've colored, in a lot of these, we've color colored the atoms to get a sense, not for every single step what's going on, but generally what parts of the molecule end up in uh, which of our metabolites. Okay, and so let's look at uh, some aromatic amino acids. So a lot of metabolic diseases occur with the processing of aromatic amino acids. So if you're interested in medicine, pay attention here. So we have phenylalanine, and you could think, well, phenylalanine is very similar in structure to tyrosine. So it would be a simple matter to add that, that para-hydroxyl group uh, to phenylalanine to make tyrosine. So that's catalyzed by an enzyme. If that enzyme has a defect, if it's not functional, um, then we're going to begin to build up a phenylalanine. And the best we can really do with that is do an amino transferase reaction to make a, a keto group. But so if you have a deficiency in that enzyme, you're going to build up um, early uh, metabolites of uh, phenylalanine. You're not going to really have a way to uh, deal with those carbon skeletons. And that buildup causes the disease, causes the mental ret retardation in PKU. Um, and each of these steps, you can see there's all these different steps. And at every step, is there's a deficiency in an enzyme. Um, you're not going to be able to fully metabolize that amino acid. So something unnatural is going to build up. So you have various tyrosinemias. So tyrosine, um, uh, you can look at the way that we're uh, um, disassembling the aromatic ring. You say, well, that's pretty hard to do to bust open an aromatic ring. That's a pretty stable structure. And so what we're doing is activating it to this uh, form here, where we have these two hydroxyl groups. And then in the next step, we pry the ring apart. Uh, and that requires some energy. So we have an oxygen molecule involved there. And now we have a linear form of the molecule, where these carbons that are highlighted here end up over here. And then through a few more steps, we can get to uh, fumarate, which feeds directly into the TCA cycle, or ac acetoacetyl-CoA, -co um, which can be used uh, to make a, a, a ketone bodies, right? So, um, so this is ketogenic and glucogenic, OK? So branch chain amino acids, I know it's sort of tedious. There's a lot of amino acids. We're not going to look at them all. We're looking at quite a few of them. So here's a branch chain amino acid. Uh, these things, first, you have the amino transferase. You see a common theme. In general, you do with, deal with the amino group right away, and then you disassemble uh, the carbon skeleton. So we transfer the amino group away. 
right, onto our storage molecule. And now we have the alpha keto acids. But conveniently, for all these amino acids, we have the alpha keto acids, but you have this carboxylate. And so we can decarboxylate these molecules and add a, a, a CoA functionality. And so this is, the, this is a dehydrogenase enzyme. So right, we're oxidizing uh, this molecule. So we have an aldehyde equivalent that's oxidized to an, a carboxylic acid equivalent. This is the exact same uh, enzyme that we saw with pyruvate dehydrogenase, right? When we converted pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. The exact same set, set of cofactors are involved with that. Uh, and so then we have this CoA metabolite, which can be converted into a variety of end products that can be used to make energy, uh, either ketone bodies or fed directly into the citric acid cycle, these two. Okay, and so... Uh, here, uh, we have another disease. So if you have a deficiency in this enzyme, you begin to build up, especially uh, this uh, isoleucine metabolite, which is converted into this structure, which smells like maple syrup, right? And so the reason that people that have a deficiency in this disease, um, they have this uh, peculiar aroma. They smell like a, a, a maple tree walking around. Um, and that's because they have this sotalone hanging out. Um, in their bodies because they don't know their bodies have not they cannot feed these carbon skeletons into energy generating pathways this is an aromatic volatile compound maple syrup urine disease back in the old days they used to taste and smell just so you know but luckily doctors don't have to do that anymore okay we can uh, take asparagine or aspartate and move it into oxaloacetate. And so asparagine, you could say, oh, okay, yeah, I can just hydrolyze off that amido group to make the carboxylic acid. So we're at aspartate. And then the aspartate, uh, we can uh, deaminate uh, here to make the alpha keto acid. And as it turns out, because of the original structure of this molecule, we do these two simple steps and we're already at oxaloacetate. We could feed that right into Krebs cycle. So that, one, or, that one's pretty easy, straightforward. So what we're doing here is we're just feeding all these molecules. We're first dealing with the amino group that gets eventually put on uh, urea. And the carbon skeletons are degraded so that they can feed into Krebs cycle, either in the liver tissue or being transferred as ketone bodies uh, to other tissues where they feed into Krebs cycle. Okay. Any questions so far on catabolism of amino acids? <sighs> it's a lot of stuff, I know. Painful. Okay, we're going to start building up again. So the, let's look at the biosynthetic pathways. Um, and so ammonia is incorporated uh, uh, through glutamate and glutamine. So obviously we're making amino acids. So we're going to assemble the alpha keto carbon skeleton separately, and then we're going to add the amino group. And the amino group uh, is being transferred uh, from glutamate or glutamine. And so glutamate can be interconverted into glutamine. And so uh, first, you activate the carboxylic uh, acid right, uh, with the synthetase that uses ATP hydrolysis. And then you have this gamma glutamyl phosphate, uh, which can be used uh, to react directly with an ammonia molecule to make glutamine. Okay, so both glutamate and glutamine are important in adding nitrogen atoms to amino acid structures. Okay? And so this is an amidation step here. Okay, does that make sense? All right, and so this is an early a step or an important step uh, in the pathway, so it's heavily regulated. And you might think about it, well, this is a little bit dicey. We have 20 amino acids, and proteins sort of need you know, all of those amino, or amino acids to, to, to make proteins. And so we need some way to have the regulation in these pathways since and correct for precisely the right amount of each amino acid. Um, but here we have sort of a set of feedback inhibitions. So uh, glutamine can be fed into incorporating nitrogen in uh, things like uh, AMP, CTP, tryptophan, histidine. So those are feeding back. But you might say, okay, well, red X, it's digital, right? It feeds back, and if any one of those molecules is there, it cuts it off. But that wouldn't be good because there's other molecules that we need to make. And so this is a rheostat. Each of these uh, inhibitors, Allosteric uh, inhibitors is just slowing down the rate just a little bit. 
And so the combination, so if you begin to have all of these present, then the rate of this greatly diminishes. But with just one, present, one of these products present, it just goes down a little bit. Okay, and so there's a variety of feedback inhibitors, and you can see, ah, carbon oil phosphate. Why would the cell want to regulate this thing by carbon oil phosphate? Anybody have an idea? Drink. Where did we see that bad boy? You remember? It was way back ten minutes ago. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. So it's, that was a catabolic uh, pathway. And so why might carbon oil phosphate turn off this pathway? Yes. Oh, let's say again, I'm sorry. Exactly. So this is a form of reciprocal regulation. Remember, I bring this up again and again. You don't want to necessarily just be, you know, building up, breaking down, building up, breaking down. And so by having carbon oil phosphate regulate the uh, the formation of the thing that's going to be adding amino groups to uh, amino acids, well, that's that's helpful, right? Because then you won't be doing both at the same time. So there's all kinds of levels of activation. But wait, it gets better. This is, this is a rheostat with each of these inhibitors um, turning up the rheostat, but you can adjust the, the global sensitivity of, the re of this rheostat, making the inhibitors more efficacious by another mechanism. So you have uh, the adenylation of the glutamine synthetase, so you're adding an adenyl uh, group to a tyrosine. Um, that uh, turns up the sensitivity of this allosteric regulation of this enzyme, so it becomes more sensitive to inhibitors. So in the presence of some of those inhibitors we just saw, if the enzyme is adenylated, then that's going to make it more, it's going to be more inhibited. You know, so it's going to be decreased. And so, but this enzyme is also activated or inhibited by a uridylation. So the uridylation of the adenylyl transferase uh, turns off the uh, adenylyl transferase. And this uridyl, uridylyl uh, uh, transferase is itself allosterically regulated. So we've sort of bumped, this is a cascade of, of inactivations. Um, but the starting point is um, here at this uridylyl uh, transferase. And so this is turned on by alpha ketoglutarate and ATP. These, 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 uh, what, these are indicators of energy. There's lots of energy present. We have ATP, we have alpha ketoglutarate, or you know, uh, uh, it's inactivated uh, by glutamine, right? or uh, inorganic phosphate, inorganic phosphate being a marker for low amount of energy in the cell. And so this enzyme is going to be more active when it's time to do an anabolic process, when there's high ATP or high alpha-ketoglutarate. And it's going to be less active with a glutamine or inorganic phosphate. Okay. So there's layers of regulation giving us amplification of um, the regulatory pathways. But that is not the only form of regulation of synthesis of amino acids. That's a bulk regulation, right? We need something to uniquely regulate the formation of each amino acid. And we'll see how that's done in a moment. So now we have synthesized a glutamine, and we need some way to transfer that to a substrate. And this is uh, catalyzed by glutamine amido transferases. So we're transferring the amido nitrogen, not the amino nitrogen, by first releasing it from the glutamine, making a transient a covalent bond to the enzyme. This ammonia then moves through a channel to a second active site where it then reacts with uh, some kind of activated molecule. Okay, and so out, and then we release the glutamate. So we loaded the ammonia on to glutamine, and then it's used to be transferred to some other molecule uh, and regenerating the glutamate. Okay, so these are in the general class of enzymes that allow us to utilize that uh, uh, glutamine that we've synthesized. Okay? So um, here's all the amino acids. We're going to go into even less detail on how we make each of these amino acids. Um, each of the amino acids are built from different 
building blocks. So um, alpha-ketoglutarate, for example, is used to make this group of amino acids. 3-phosphoglycerate is from what pathway? Dun, dun, dun. Glycolysis, yeah. So we're using both TCA intermediates and glycolytic intermediates, TCA, right? This is sort of both because it feeds between the two pathways. PEP or uh, erythrose, you might say, or ribose 5-phosphate. Where do we see that bad boy? So remember the pentose phosphate pathway, that evil uh, pathway? One of the evil outcomes of that pathway is to make uh, histidine amino acids with the ribose 5-phosphate. Okay, so let's put this together. Let's look at the big picture. So you have both glycolytic intermediates and Krebs cycle intermediates feeding into the synthesis of these molecules. We know, well, so the, uh, they sort of all attach, and glycolysis is attached to pentose phosphate, right? So we can make ribose phosphate. 5-phosphate and histidine. 3-phosphoglycerate can be used uh, in this way, PEP and pyruvate. So there's all of these different ways to make molecules. You shouldn't be ultra concerned with memorizing which comes with which. If I show you some kind of, spend a little bit more time on it today, then those are the ones that you should focus more on. So pyruvate, we can also use uh, Krebs cycle intermediates, pyruvate, oxaloacetate, and alpha-ketoglutarate to make a variety of amino acids. So this is the, you know, from 10,000 foot view of how we make amino acids. So we'll look at a few of these. Um, so here's alpha-ketoglutarate. The same strategy is used as before. We uh, overlap the pathways for efficiency, right? And so we, uh, from glutamate, we can make glutamine, proline, and arginine. Okay, so we have overlap pathways, but we're not going to look at the individual reactions for that one, but we are going to look at this one because it's pretty straightforward. So 3-phosphoglycerate is first converted to serine. That serine can then be converted to glycine or cysteine. Okay, and so here's 3-phosphoglycerate. You might think about it. It's like, wow, we're pretty close. If we just turn this into an alpha-keto acid, then we can transaminate that thing and make something very close to a serine. So first, we uh, oxidize the hydroxyl group to a carbonyl. That's an alpha keto acid. So we can uh, um, we can use an amino transferase enzyme to transfer an am amino group from glutamate to um, this 3-phosphohydroxypyruvate to make our 3-phosphoserine. And so then we just need a phosphatase, and we clip off the phosphate off the end of this molecule. So this is pretty uh, straightforward. You can see that these are, let's see, here you have three carbons, here you have three carbons. You just had to rearrange stuff a little bit. The three phosphoserine, okay, that can feed into other molecules. So we can take the uh, a serine, and we can use the phosphatase to make a serine. And then we can, uh, we've already seen sort of a similar reaction here, um, but we can take the serine and uh, use our uh, THF cofactor uh, to make glycine. Okay, so we can take that CH2OH group and st stick it on the THF cofactor, and there we are, we're at glycine. Okay. All right. The cysteine gets a little bit more compli complicated. So it turns out the cysteine is sort of con conditionally essential. So methionine is essential amino acid, but methionine is used to make cysteine. So, you know, we make cysteine technically, but we make it out of an essential amino acid. And so um, you have homocysteine, right? And so homocysteine can be condensed with serine. And look at this thing. We're making a new bond where we can have, we bring a sulfur in between these two um, metabolites, and then we have options. We can break on either side, right? So we come together like this, and then we cleave over here. So we're taking that sulfur off the homocysteine and sticking it on uh, a, a, to make a cysteine molecule. And we've just bound the two together and then cleave the other bond, releasing cysteine. So that was pretty straightforward. But where did the homocysteine come from? Well, that came from methionine. Uh, so here's homocysteine. Methionine uh, can be uh, reacted to make our SAM, this uh, uh, prosthetic uh, group, and so we can take the AMP 
and the AMP is reacted with methionine, releasing um, pyrophosphate, um, which pushes the reaction forward. But that gives us this uh, S adenosyl methionine, where we have this positively charged sulfur atom uh, in our methyl group. We can then use that to transfer the methyl group to something else. And then all we have to do is uh, release uh, this uh, adenosyl uh, group uh, to make homocysteine. So this is basically homocysteine. Cysteine just has one methylene group, remember, not two. Uh, and so um, we can make that just by releasing the adenosine group. So this uh, methionine is essential. We can't make it. And it's used to make the, the non-essential cysteine. So cysteine is sort of conditionally essential. Do you essentially get it? All right. That wasn't very good. I try. OK, so oxaloacetate. Now we're getting very distance. There's a lot of pathways underneath here. Oxaloacetate can be used to make of, uh, aspartate, which in, then is fed into a synthesis of these four amino acids. Pyruvate can be used to make these amino acids. In general, the pathways that uh, synthesize these amino acids require ATP, uh, NADPH, and transamination uh, reactions to put the amino group on. Many of them involve carbon group transfers on our uh, carbon group transfer or molecule. So, all right. This one is pretty straightforward. OAA to aspartic acid, because that's the alpha keto acid of aspartic acid. Yes? So, aspartate after it is produced from C3 acid cycle? Yep. Can the aspartate after it is produced from C3 acid cycle? Yeah. There's options. You can, options, right? right. So how does it decide? Undoubtedly, there's a fine set of allosteric regulations. There's separate enzymes um, that lead to different fates for that aspartate molecule, right? And so you can regulate each of those enzymes so that you get the right amount of each of these amino acids. And also, you're able to do the urea cycle. Urea cycle is aspartate neutral. Because remember, aspartate is always regenerated from fumarate. So in some sense, you could sort of ignore that. It's not depleting aspartate. It's just cycling aspartate to fumarate back to aspartate to fumarate because of the shunting reaction. So, But if we want to make molecules, we have to take aspartate molecules out and then make these other amino acids. I guess, yeah, makes sense. OK. So in pyruvate, remember, that's the alpha keto acid of alanine. So you have carboxylate carbonyl, methyl group, and pyruvate. And we just transaminate to make uh, uh, alanine, which just has a methyl group side chain. OK, pretty straightforward. We can stitch together uh, these molecules to make uh, the beginning molecules in the used in the synthesis of aromatic amino acids. Um, this is an important precursor in the uh, synthesis of aromatic amino acids. Phenylalanine and tryptophan are essential. So um, the pathways that stitch these molecules together are found in plant cells. And so the plant cells are uh, make those amino acids, and then animals eat them up. <laughs> OK, histidine is crazy. So you have this ribose 5-phosphate, right? One, two, three, four, five carbons. That ribose 5-phosphate gets in, ends up in the histidine molecule all spread out. So you break that ring open, and you lay it out like this, and then you attach some other groups to it. Um, we're not going to talk about you know, exactly how that's done, but it involves PRPP, which is not only uh, important in the synthesis of histidine, it's also used in the synthesis of nucleotides. And so that's an important uh, precursor. And uh, yeah, so this pentose phosphate intermediate, or, or end product of pentose phosphate pathway, can be used uh, to make uh, histidine. OK, so general, you can sort of see how they're stitched together. All right, so here's a summary of everything from 10,000 feet. We have um, each of these amino acids uh, is synthesized from different precursors. And some of the synth synthetic uh, pathways are overlapping. So now we need to deal with this issue that we left unresolved, the regulation of this pathway. So we need just the right amount of each of the 20 amino acids. If we regulate uh, um, you know, upstream, way upstream, that's not going to give us the fine tuning we need uh, for you know, regulating the exact amount of each of the amino acids. We need to 
to think about how uh, this comes together. So there's all these different pathways that uh, feed into amino acid uh, synthesis, but many of them share common precursors and uh, have overlapping pathways. So we need to deal with this uh, problem. And the way that we deal with this is isoenzymes. And so um, here, for example, we have a stacked pathway. Aspartate leads to the synthesis of lysine, leads to synthesis of methionine, and then isoleucine. So if we just turned off the, this enzyme here, um, we would turn off the synthesis of all of these amino acids. We need a way of dialing down the enzymes, not a digital switch, an analog switch. So by having different forms of the enzymes, they're each subjectable to different allosteric regulation, we can dial things down but not completely off. So for example, you have um, uh, these feedback regulators um, from threonine. So if those are inhibited, we still have um, some flux through this uh, pathway in here to make our isoleucine. Because we always need to, in the last step, convert threonine to isoleucine. So for lysine, that feedback's here, but um, some of those substrates can get through, get past that regulation by using the different forms of the enzyme. So you have this fine tuning of all these different uh, very similar uh, protein uh, sequences um, that are catalyzing the same reaction, allowing us to get exactly the amount of flux through each part of the overlapping segments of the pathway. So does that make sense? <laughs> Painful. OK. That is the 10,000 foot view of amino acid synthesis with a little bit of details here and there. But now you think about um, uh, amino acids, where did the amino group came from, come from? You know, we don't have the capability to make ammonia, right? So there's lots of nitrogen, it's like 80% nitrogen or so in the air into gas. So, you know, if you would just let things go, you know, to their thermodynamic uh, endpoint, you would end up with just oxidized form of nitrogen. So, you know, ammonia is the most reduced form of nitrogen. So we need some way to synthesize um, ammonia. So there's this nitrogen cycle that goes through each of the oxidation, possible oxidation states of nitrogen. So there's a set of bacteria. Remember, fish are releasing ammonia directly. And then there's a set of bacteria that can oxidize that. So this is an oxy. They, they literally are burning ammonia. Right? Oxidation reactions are, are exer highly exergonic. So these organisms derive synthesis of ATP from um, burning uh, ammonia to nitrate and nitrate uh, to ni or nitrite to nitrate. Um, but then uh, there's other bacteria that do the opposite reaction. And so they take a fully oxidized molecule and convert it uh, into a more reduced form of the molecule. Why would they do that? Let me give you a hint. These are uh, necessarily anaerobic um, bacteria that do this. So what do we do? So we're aerobic organisms, right? What do we do with the oxygen? Why do we need oxygen? We're bringing all the pathways together. Exactly. So if you're an anaerobic bacteria, you don't have anything to pass your electrons to. You don't have the oxygen to pass your electrons to. But you could just pass it to some other oxidized molecule. Right? So this is the this is how you deposit those electrons that have come through the same similar electron transport chains. And then you just, in the last step, instead of depositing the electrons on oxygen, you deposit them on uh, nitrate to make uh, nitrogen gas. And so we have all this nitrogen gas around. But then, uh, you know, there's this other uh, conversion, conversion of nitrogen gas to ammonia. In other, wor in other words, uh, fertilizer synthesis. And so this reaction, you might think, well, surely exergonic, right? Is it? Is that an ex? Would you guess that the uh, um, reduction here is exergonic? Okay. Well, this is. Um, let's see. The full oxidation. That's this part here, 
And so that's exergonic. Going the other way, could that be exergonic? Hmm. This nitrogen fixing? It is. Um, the, and that's very surprising. Nitrogen gas converted to ammonia releases 33 kilojoules per mole. So that's an e easy reaction, right? Well, there's this little problem. That bond is about 1,000 kilojoules per mole in strength the bond between those two nitrogen atoms. It is exergonic. At equilibrium, there would be a 100,000-fold excess of ammonia compared to nitrogen gas. But there's this little problem in between. A 1,000 kilojoules per mole is necessary to crack those two nitrogen atoms apart. So although it's exergonic, delta G double dagger is huge. It's 1,000 kilojoules per mole. There's a huge activation uh, barrier to this reaction. So it's thermodynamically very favorable, but uh, kinetically impossible. Do you see that? So you can read it too. Okay, so you might think, well, there's a, you can do this chemically. You can take your nitrogen and, and um, a billion people on Earth are dependent on this reaction. If this reaction didn't occur, billions of people would die. This is how we make fertilizers. We take nitrogen and we put tremendous amount of energy into that molecule. We, we you know, bake it at 400 degrees and put it under hundreds of pounds of pressure because we're trying to pry those two nitrogen atoms apart. That's a tremendous amount of energy that's necessary chemically to cr transform nitrogen gas to ammonia. But if we want to do this you know, with enzymes, um, these enzymes have been uh, e evolved such that they can do this reaction at atmospheric pressure at room temperature. So you think about it, it's, what an amazing enzyme. You take something that requires tremendous amounts of energy and you are able to do it under standard conditions. And so this occurs in these uh, uh, denitrogenase uh, enzymes and there's a, a little electron transport going on here. And so here's a complex between the two enzymes that are involved in this reaction. So you have the dinitrogenase reductase um, which is uh, transferring electrons uh, here to uh, our dinitrogenase in the center, I believe. Yep, so here's our dinitrogenase in the center. And inside of the dinitrogenase are all these very ornate and elaborate metal clusters. Uh, remember that? Remember that oxygen evolving complex that we saw before? had those really, these are batteries. See the batteries? They're right here. And we're taking these electrons and charging the batteries one electron at a time. Transferring from some original source down into this reductase, the reductase transfers electrons one at a time. It begins to charge up the batteries in these metal centers to the point where we've invested a tremendous amount of energy in here and in one step it takes into and makes ammonia. Okay, we don't want to get stuck somewhere in between for the same reason that we talked about with the oxygen evolving complex. We don't want any free radicals going on. Okay, so let's look at each of these steps. The dinitrogenase uh, reductase is a, literally, it's just a one electron carrier. But, so, so it accepts an electron from ferredoxin. Where did we see ferredoxin before? There's a lot of questions today. Zoro. Yeah. Zoro. Yep, yep, photosystem one, very good. And what was it used to do there in photosystem one, that ferredoxin? NADP oxido you know, reductase enzyme, it's, it's making NADPH molecules, transferring electrons to the NADPH synthesizing enzyme. But here we can also use those electrons on ferredoxin to transfer them to the dinitrogenase uh, enzyme by first transferring them to the reductase. So the ferredoxin binds to the dinitrogenase reductase, transfers one electron at a time, this uh, reductase then cleaves two ATP molecules, which allows to jam those electrons into the dinitrogenase and, and also, you know, give some energy into the dinitrogenase. Okay, so for every electron we jam into the dinitrogenase, we cleave two ATP molecules. Okay, and so what do we have here? We have a six-electron transformation 
of uh, our N2 to make NH3. So now those electrons are received on the dinitrogenase one at a time and stored in these elaborate metal clusters. So there's a molybdenum metal ion here, and that's also involved in holding this thing together. So we charge it up. We put a tremendous amount of energy, hundreds and hundreds of kilojoules per mole of energy into this dinitrogenase so that when it binds nitrogen in one bolt, it, it transfers those electrons to its final product. And so here, we derive those electrons from metabolism. So we take pyruvate dehydrogenase, for example. Um, um, we can uh, make some NADH, which then eventually you can transfer those electrons onto ferredoxin one at a time to make the uh, reduced form. Transfer from one electron at a time from ferredoxin to the dinitrogenase reductase, which when ATP is hydrolyzed, it allows you to transfer electrons from this enzyme to this enzyme, the, di uh, the dinitrogenase. Okay, so you have this conformational change of the dinitrogenase reductase, which is catalyzed by ATP hydrolysis. And that allows you to have enough energy to insert these electrons where they need to go in the dinitrogenase when they're transferred. And you say, well, wait a minute. The um, reaction we're doing here involves six electrons. But because of the mechanism of this enzyme, we're not only um, reducing nitrogen uh, to ammonia, we're also uh, reducing protons to hydrogen gas. That's a necessary part. So actually, it takes eight uh, electrons in this process. So, and that means 16 ATP molecules needed to be used up to uh, make this uh, NH4, this ammonia molecule. So that's a tremendous amount of energy. Any questions so far? Any of that stuff? All right. tough one, huh? <laughs>
test, test, test. Okay, uh, turn off the clicker. Turn off the clicker. Turn off the clicker. So why was I chuckling? <laughs> and people were struggling up here, you know. So why? So one of the answers was uh, uh, reductive deamination. Why is that wrong? Oxidative. Yes, it's going the other way. So, and what is NADP a cofactor? Yeah. Yes. She's sure. Okay, so the correct answer was D. D. Good for you.